Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, or STFM's Introduction to Careers in Family Medicine webinar. My name is Tom Van Sagi, and I'm STFM's Director of Online Education. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're expecting this webinar to be one of the most popular we've ever hosted, with over 81 people registered. Over the next 90 minutes, a few of the nation's top leaders in academic family medicine are going to provide you with a comprehensive and energizing introduction to the field of academic family medicine. The goal is to encourage and inspire you to learn more and perhaps pursue a career where you can educate and develop the next generation of our nation's family physicians. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on, S on the STFM website at stfm.org backslash webinars within a couple of days. This site also contains a complete archive of past STFM webinars and has, has information to register, register for future rep webinars. We hope you'll participate in the discussion tonight by asking questions by typing them into the box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Panelists will field questions at the conclusion of the webinar, but we'll be happy to try to answer questions as we move through the presentations. I also serve as the director of the North American Primary Care Research Organization and um, happen to have a, a PhD in political science. So I'm not uh, somebody that pursued a career in academic family medicine, but joined a joined the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine in NAFCRAG about nine months ago, and it's been a great, a great career move. But now I'd like to introduce you to the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine Board of Directors Resident Representative, Dr. Esther Johnston. Dr. Johnston is a third year resident at the University of Arizona Department of Family and Community Medicine, and she's currently doing medical work at the Shine Academy in Kibera, an impoverished area outside of Nairobi in Kenya. It's about eight hours later there, so it's something like 4 a.m. in the morning. Dr. Johnson is so passionate about encouraging residents and medical students to consider academic family medicine, she led the creation of this webinar and wouldn't, wouldn't let her busy international work stand in the way of facilitating the discussion tonight. Dr. Johnson, if you're still awake, take it away. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Tom, and welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm very excited. This is our first uh, resident web webinar focusing on careers in academic family medicine. Um, we're hoping that you'll all get a lot of out of this uh, webinar tonight. Uh, before we do begin, um, since I've already gotten this wonderful introduction from Tom, I'm going to skip ahead uh, to the outline for our talk. But before we start, I did want to give a shout out to another resident, Cole Zanetti from Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency Program. Um, it was after a conversation with Cole at the uh, Kansas City Conference this summer through the AFP that um, we first began to think about this idea of having a webinar specifically for residents who wanted to pursue a career path towards a faculty position in family medicine. Um, and so I do just want to let others know that if you have additional ideas for SDFM programming, we're always really excited to hear those and uh, develop those. So uh, this is the uh, basic outline for our talk tonight. We're going to be discussing what is academic family medicine and discuss both some of the traditional roles and non-traditional roles uh, through which you can pursue a career in academic medicine. Um, we'll be discussing community precepting and also the diversity of faculty positions in terms of settings, focus, uh, the actual search for a faculty position, i.e. how do you find one, how do you interview for one, and the career path that you uh, might be able to expect if you're entering the field. And then we'll discuss some resources that may be able to help you along that path. So we have a, a really wonderful uh, group of speakers with us tonight, and I want to start out by introducing our first faculty member on the call. Uh, this is Dr. Lindsay Botsford. Um, Lindsay, if you want to uh, speak to the audience and give us a little bit of information about your own career path in family medicine. Thanks, Esther. I'd be glad to. So I'm probably the newest faculty member on the panel this evening, and I graduated from Baylor Family Medicine Residency in 2010, and in serving as the chief resident there, I think got even more interested in teaching and organizing and the idea of continuing research in my future career. Um, I had always been interested in leadership and education, but I think was unsure about academics. I, kind of looked at employed positions, but realized that if I wanted to do research and teaching, it would all kind of be on the side or after hours. Um, so after I finished residency, I wound up working for a year while I finished my MBA on the weekends. And I think it was at that time when I realized that I couldn't see myself not being in an educational environment for my future career. So. Um, 
I, I guess through involvement in my state academy, I've met different program directors, different residencies, and um, got in touch with the program director at um, the Houston Methodist San Jacinto Family Medicine Residency Program just outside of Houston. And they needed a faculty, and it was close to home, and it enabled me to do full scope family medicine plus OB, um, stay in a big city, and have opportunities to teach and do research. So it was kind of my dream job, and had it there, and had a great first two years out in practice. Um, I think one of the things that really attracted me doing an academic position right out of residency was that I got to keep my scope um, and all those procedures and OB and skills you stayed up many hours during residency to do, you got to stay active in doing um, right out of residency. Um, so I spent two years as faculty at San Jacinto uh, Family Medicine in Baytown and recently transitioned to a faculty role at Memorial Family Medicine Residency. It's in Sugar Land, just outside of Houston, and there's another community-based, unopposed residency, and it's been great. I think I continue to keep my full scope and continue to have time for research, some quality improvement, and teaching of medical students and residents. So for me, it's my dream job. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, let's go to our next speaker. Our next uh, speaker this evening is Dr. Mark Ryan. Mark, if you could let us know about your own career path and how you found your way into academic medicine. Sure. So I came to academic medicine in a more roundabout way in the sense that I finished my med school in Richmond, Virginia, and then did my residency in Blackstone, Virginia, a rural program about an hour and a half outside of Richmond. And uh, very much loved the role of the, the small town family doctor liked that, that, that lifestyle, liked working with folks from that setting, and went into a private practice in a small town nearby for four years. And after a couple of years, I started working with my medical school, uh, VCU in Richmond, to uh, precept medical students in the clinic and to work with them in their family medicine clerkship. And over the next couple of years, found that I really enjoyed that um, I liked the practice part, but I really enjoyed the teaching, and I, I was maybe more effective at it than I had been afraid I might be. So as things moved along, and my wife and I looked at some other options in terms of jobs and whatnot, we ended up coming back to Richmond uh, for me to work at VCU, initially clinical, working with students in their clerkship, but then transitioning into an increasingly academic setting um, about a year and a half ago, I started working with our international inner city and rural preceptorship program, our I2CRP program, which works with medical students that are interested in medically underserved careers, um, helping out with the program director and the medical director for the program as a, a way of getting some more experience and again found that I really enjoyed that piece of it and really was excited to do more of it. and eventually over the summer applied for the job to become the medical director for that program as the previous director moved on to other projects. I've been the acting director for a little while but I've been the formal director now for a couple of months and it's been a whole lot of fun working with a different side of the medical education process. I still uh, precept students in the clerkship, I still precept students in a teaching clinic that we have on Monday evenings but I'm actually now more involved in the core curriculum process, developing lesson plans and goals and outcomes and figuring out the best way to teach and assess learners. Something I've never done before. And to be honest, it's a new skill set, but one that I enjoy both for the experience and the, the, the increase in the knowledge I have for my own part, but the ability to work with students in a, a more ongoing longitudinal way over a number of years of medical school as opposed to the one-month clerkship. And along with that, the uh, medical school has changed its curriculum and I'm helping teach part of the longitudinal curriculum on patient, physician, and society. There's a few of us in family medicine and population health that are doing this. It's new in the, the curriculum and it's also been another new experience and a new set of challenges and rewards as we've gone forward. So we'll talk in more detail, I suppose, as we go along about the specifics, but a bit more roundabout private practice, then community preceptorship, then 
little bit more of a peripheral role in the department and now uh, to a point where I'm about half clinical and half academic in the work that I do. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Um, our next speaker has uh, seen also a, a diversity of um, experiences throughout his, his career as a, a member of academic family medicine. He's currently the president of the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine. Uh, so, John, if you want to tell us a little bit about your path. Sure, thank you, Esther. Um, well, I'm very happy to be here today, and I'm very glad that there are so many residents interested in listening about careers and in academic family medicine. I, I grew up in a small town in Ohio and wanted to be a teacher when I when I finished college. Um, but I went into medical school um, uh, actually thinking that I'd be a rural physician by the time I got through medical school. I did my residency in the Army to pay back a, uh, a ROTC scholarship and then uh, went from my residency right into uh, teaching in a military community hospital program for the first four years out of residency. In that role, I was seeing patients about 60 or 70 percent of my time, and I was increasingly uh, more involved with uh, teaching in the behavioral science curriculum and teaching, uh, or leading one of the teams in the residency there. And during those four years, I did a faculty development fellowship at the University of North Carolina. I actually came out of residency in 1982, and so I've been in academic family medicine now for more than 30 years. Um, at the end of my four-year uh, obligation to the Army, um, I left the military and moved to Oregon to become the residency director here in a university-based program uh, starting in 1986, and I did that job for eight years. Uh, as the residency got bigger and our program grew, um, managed care and the, and the Clinton health plan was actually rolling out. And, um, I took a leave of absence from the residency to start a Medicaid HMO here in Oregon. Um, learned a lot about managed care and, and how health plans saw the world. Uh, took over as director of the statewide AHEP program here. Established two additional residencies in the state in that capacity. And since 1998, I've been the chair of the Department of Family Medicine. Uh, today, my work, uh, my work week, um, involves seeing patients about a quarter of my time. I still have a full scope practice, including inpatient care and maternity care. Um, I serve as the attending on our inpatient service um, and uh, see a lot of patients in my practice that have been with me now for, for most of the 27 years that I've been here. I have um, uh, a lot of administrative responsibilities as the department chairman, but I'm involved actively with teaching residents in our three residency programs here and with medical students in the medical school. Um, I think I've personally interacted with every student for the last 20 years that has uh, completed the clerkship in family medicine here in Oregon. Um, about 20 percent of my time right now is devoted to uh, serving as STFM president and I'm also the editor of STFM's journal Family Medicine so I do a lot of, of scholarly work around um, managing the peer review process for these uh, journal articles that are submitted. And I spend um, about 20% of my time on my own research, which has tended to focus around continuity of care and the doctor-patient relationship. Um, as SDFM president, I think that we have a really um, significant need for a lot of graduating residents to enter academic family medicine if we're willing to define that broadly to include everything from working in a full-time faculty position to being willing to precept with students or residents in your own office. Um, our training programs have expanded very substantially over the last decade and I think we, we have uh, always have need for, for new people who want to spend their careers working on this and so I'm, I'm very excited to be able to talk with all of you today. All right, thank you very much John. What John has just touched on is how broad the definition of academic family medicine is, and even though we're starting off by um, with a, a definition here of a of what academic family medicine is, I'm hoping that all of the careers that you've just heard about have really highlighted how diverse the experiences are that you can find within academic family medicine. Um, so we've sort of loosely defined it as a commitment to participating um, in scholarship and medical education, and. As you've seen, that can be done in a very diverse array of settings, from university centers to community programs and clinics. 
So I, I'd actually like to go back to John for a second just to talk a little bit about what sort of the traditional family medicine academic roles are. So I think that um, I've always thought about this as, as um, starting off with a, the basic question of whether you want to be a teacher and scholar in family medicine who sees patients sometimes or whether you want to be a clinical family physician who teaches and does some scholarship. In the former role, um, there we have large numbers of community-based preceptors. Here in Oregon, more than 150 physicians have faculty appointments in my department. Many of them are in full-time practice and have students from our Principles of Clinical Medicine course or from our Family Medicine clerkship that come to their office. A number of them host residents that come for either required or elective rotations uh, to their communities. Um, these community-based docs are practicing uh, full-time, but they're very involved with our students and residents, and our, there's no way our academic program could be successful without them. So at its most basic level, um, the, the um, entry point for academic family medicine for many people is a willingness to be involved as a teacher and scholar while in the context of a community practice, and there's a very rich tradition in our field of doing that. As you move to um, the idea of being sort of employed in academic family medicine, um, there are lots of people who enter faculty roles in a community-based residency. These folks um, are generally looking to have a greater teaching role. They're more involved in the didactic curriculum with residents. They serve as resident advisors in the program. Um, being employed means that they have some responsibility for the curriculum beyond just having an individual learner come to their office. Um, and many of them are, are pursuing a career employed within academic family medicine. The clinical faculty in a community-based residency and in a university setting often have very similar jobs. I suppose the university setting probably has more medical students and of course there's medical school courses that, uh, that faculty in the university setting can become responsible for. You have a greater role in, in trying to decide what the curriculum for medical students should be. Um, but even in a community-based setting, there's often residents that do rotations in community-based residencies, as many of you probably did when you were applying to residencies as a senior student. So both um, of these clinical faculty roles um, can involve both student and resident education. Um, I would emphasize that these are clinical faculty because they're seeing patients a lot. And in our setting, entry-level clinical faculty here at OHSU are seeing patients seven to eight half days per week. Um, we do that because we really think that people need to solidify their clinical skills after their training. So whether you're going right into a clinical faculty role or whether you're going into practice in the community, um, often people start their academic career with lots of patient care responsibilities. Now, as you move along in your career, opportunities present themselves to be a course director or to be a medical student education director in a department or to be an associate residency director or a residency director. And at this level, you actually have responsibility for the program. Um, you have a greater role in um, determining, for example, which residents you, you, you rank in the match and um, a much greater um, leadership role in how the curriculum plays out. In a university setting, this often involves a decision about whether to be on the tenure track or whether to um, pursue advancement through the academic ranks, which often have very formal requirements about things like conducting research or writing papers or making national presentations. But some degree of scholarship is important for anybody that's employed in, in academic family medicine. And even faculty that are in community-based programs have um, increasing scholarly requirements in the residency accreditation process. Um, eventually, um, there are people who get research grants and, and take additional training like fellowships uh, to learn for, um, basic research skills. Um, I always encourage um, graduating residents to think that you haven't really learned much about research in your residency. There's, there's additional training that's required if you're going to actually get substantial funding from the government or from foundations to pay for your research. And so a big part of these skills are learning how to, to get funding for your research. And in fact, as you move along through your faculty career, a big characteristic 
of successful faculty is that they're able to get funding to support their programs, funding to support their own research, um, and you get the skills of being able to do that. And then finally, I think that there are people who get into administrative leadership roles uh, such as department chair positions or associate dean positions, and these have much more institutional responsibility for how programs work. So across this whole diversity of, of opportunities, there's you know a close to there's a really large number of different kinds of roles you can play, and I think all of them start for physician faculty with really really excellent clinical skills. There is no substitute. I'm sure that all of you know in your own residency that there's no substitute for your teachers being really terrific physicians. And um, so, so probably the first step on a successful faculty ladder is to be a terrific doctor, to be at the cutting edge of your field, and to have a passion for sharing ideas uh, with learners. All right, thank you, John. Um, one of the things that John just touched on was how many family medicine um, academicians begin their career uh, with, within the context of community-based precepting. And um, on the call tonight, we have uh, Mark Ryan, who's had a lot of experience in community precepting. Mark, I was wondering if you could kind of discuss how you came to be a community preceptor and how uh, the process of precepting affected your clinic flow. Sure, so I believe I started precepting in the clinic maybe my second year out of residency. The first year out of residency, moving to the, the practice, I think I felt like I needed to get my feet under me and get a little more experience just practicing out in, in a setting that wasn't a residency program or medical school anymore. Um, so it may have been the first year out, maybe my second year, I'm sorry, maybe my second or third, I can't quite remember, but I, I essentially just made contact with the department mentioned that I felt like I was in a position where I might be able to work with a student and they set me up with a student in our foundations of clinical medicine which is your introductory clinical medicine preceptorship. Um, the time commitment was much less than many of the other roles that you can play in this setting. It was one half day every other week and it let me get a little bit of experience working with a learner in a setting that was not particularly stressful or particularly taxing. Um, as I did that that year, I began to realize again my comfort level with this was more than I had anticipated. I felt like I could do this and I enjoyed doing it. It was fun having a student there. Um, we like to tell our medical students that they always keep us on our toes. They ask all these pesky questions and require that we, you know, defend what we're saying and little things like that. that keep us honest and keep us uh, focused on what we are, are, are teaching as being up to date and evidence based. So I called, the, I got back in touch with the department as we were discussing the next year and actually asked if they were interested in using the office as a preceptorship site for our M3 clerkship. At VCU, all the medical students, as in many of the medical schools, if, if not most hopefully, have a required four week our required family medicine preceptorship, ours is four weeks long. And they were very excited to, to, to see that I was interested and started setting us up with students. Usually we would take th two to four over the course of a year. And when you precept in this setting, it's probably the, the, the details are probably specific to the schools, but in most cases, you indicate the time frame that you're interested and available. You can block off months that are not good months for you because you know the holidays may be tough or you normally take a medical trip somewhere at a certain time of the year so they work around that schedule and the need and assign you students at the beginning of the year so you know when they're coming and then in preparation for each month at the beginning of the year you get a preceptor's guide that outlines the goals purposes and as key learning activities of the rotation and then in preparation for each month you get updates on the students who's coming, you get to talk to them, meet them, introduce them to the office, and then work with them in the community setting as so many of us did when we were medical students. At the time, I think I was pretty happy that they were willing to take me on as a preceptor in the sense that I hadn't had any experience before, I was fairly new, and yes, I graduated from the program, but I was also someone that hadn't done this before. Um, in terms of the question on the slide about you know how to find a position in finding learners, now that I'm on the other side where I'm the medical director of a program that is trying to place 
24 medical students a year in specialized medically underserved settings and part of a department that is working with 216 medical students in our current M1 year. Um, I realized that the equation was a little bit different than I thought. It wasn't so much me coming in hoping to find the opportunity. It was the school actively looking to find preceptors that they would trust that were had a good record that they knew from medical school that had good recommendations from other preceptors. And they were, I suspect, very happy that I presented myself as a candidate because I know now that finding good placements, committed preceptors, folks who are willing to put in the time and the effort to keep up to date and to teach well is really, really difficult. Um, so to the folks out there that might be looking at that as a potential option after residency or once in practice, I would definitely encourage you to, as, when you feel ready, when you feel like you're at that point in your career, to touch base with the medical school near you, your alma mater, the school that you might be affiliated with in some way. And I suspect that if you came in asking if there would be an opportunity for you to teach, the answer would probably be yes, very much. So, and how soon can we get you prepared? Um, it's a very challenging equation to have so many students and oftentimes a difficult match to find the right numbers of preceptors that will provide the high quality learning experience and high quality mentorship and guidance that the students should get from the rotation. The, uh, the effect of precepting on the clinical function, how the clinic works in that setting, it's always going to slow you down to some extent, but I think there's lots of tricks that you can learn along the way um, to help you with that. In our program, when we go out and do site visits to meet new preceptors and preceptors that are hopefully going to take students, we have a, a little presentation that we take with us and hit the highlights when we're there that gives some tips on how to do this, how to integrate medical students when you're working with an EHR, how to use students um, if you only have one exam room going at a time or you don't have a lot of patients at any given moment, how to have the students still have a chance to work with a patient without you just sitting on your hands. Maybe you go in and you observe them. Maybe you go in and you actually sit there and take the EHR notes while the student does the H&P. So you can observe them doing this while they're in the room and you can still keep up with the work that you're going to have to do afterwards. There's uh, SCFM and other organizations have a number of good um, resources available on how to do effective, time limited, but still very meaningful clinical precepting. And I can discuss that a little, a little bit more later on if folks are interested. It's, it's a lot of things that you can do in the moment in the precepting the patient encounter and talking about the patient after the fact and helping the student come to a decision as to what they want to do for whichever concern you're discussing at the moment where you can really engage students and really maximize their involvement and the teaching opportunity there. And I think if you do that with some guidance, some advice learned from fellow teachers in your practice or SCFM or mentors that you've worked with before or the home office which is sending you the medical students you'll work with, there are a lot of tips that you can pick up along the way that make the precepting much more smooth and much more efficient in that moment. The, uh, the evaluating learners is still something that I think is, is always a challenge for people, especially when you're working with a student, you've had them for a month, they're a good student, they're hardworking, and you like them and you hope that they might come into family medicine or you hope that you've influenced them in their career practice in some way. Evaluating them fairly and honestly is something that, that can be difficult because you're not entirely impartial at that point. The way that we do it at VCU that makes it very manageable is the university uses specific guide sheets that you can use to quantify how much the student has attained certain goals relative to their peers and relative to what they should be in their academic year. Um, we talk about the structure, we call it the rhyme structure. It's, I think, not an original thing to VCU. It's, I don't know where the origin came from, but medical students can be described as R, reporters, I, interpreters, M, managers, or E, educators, with the idea being that they start as reporters where they just present information and move on to interpret the data and the clinical findings to recommend management plans and a course of action, and then to engage in patient education. So that overall construct and then the very specific guidelines for the evaluation itself makes it more manageable. Although I still think there's an awful lot of subjectivity that comes into it. 
it is structured in a way that makes it more reliable, I think, between reporters. Um, I, I think, just to come back to the, the beginning piece, if you're in a community practice and if you begin to feel comfortable and ready to teach, and this may be, of all the options that John had mentioned earlier, the one that gives you um, less direct responsibility for the curriculum, less direct responsibility for program design, less direct time commitment of your own. When the student's with you for the month, they're very much with you for the month. Although they may work with your partners and other folks, they're your responsibility for the month if you're their primary preceptor. At the same time, when that month is gone, the patient, the student moves on, and if you don't have another student for another couple months, you can go a couple months back to your normal rhythm. Um, because of that, because it's less direct pressure and responsibility on the preceptor, it's, it's I think, a very approachable starting point. And if that should appeal to you, again, touching base with your local medical schools or the schools which you're affiliated with, I suspect you'll find a great deal of interest in working with you. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, one of the things that uh, Mark has touched on is the fact that community precepting led him um, into a career as a full-time faculty member. I wanted to uh, start by just asking Lindsay about her experiences within a community-based program and kind of what that looks like for her in terms of the time that's allotted for leadership and research and the differences in her work week compared to uh, what Mark and John will be able to tell us about their experiences in their own settings. So Lindsay, if you want to start us off. Yeah, definitely. So um, when I started my search, I you know looked a little bit at university-based programs, but at least what I found um, in Texas, where I am, is that um, much like John said, they are pretty clinically heavy uh, early on. And for me, I was looking for something that wasn't all clinical, since I kind of had my year of working in a clinic full time, and kind of thought it wasn't for me. So. Um, community-based residency program was a great fit. So for me, it's a combination of seeing patients, um, having time for scholarly work and scholarly activities, um, doing quality improvement studies and practice improvement. So I get to put my MBA skills to work. And um, then also, obviously, the teaching of students and residents. Um, so part of the administrative time that we get um, is spent doing our own scholarly activities, or for me, I also do a fair amount with my state chapter and with AEFP, so I have some time for the leadership positions I do there and time to travel to meetings and hold these positions, which is great. Um, we also uh, lecture to our residents, so some of the time is spent preparing lectures and curriculum pieces. We have aspects of the curriculum that we're responsible for, so different rotations have different faculty chaperones that kind of watch out over it, figure out what can be improved, so we spend time doing that. And then within the residency we have different committees such as curriculum committee and evaluation committee and quality improvement, so the faculty share roles in leading and participating in those committees. Um, one thing I really like about a community-based program is we get close contact with our advisees, so we get residents who we get to kind of follow through the residency process and mentor, and uh, so that's, that's a neat thing for being in a community-based program where your office is kind of right with all the residents. Um, we do also have medical students that come with us on third year and fourth year clerkships. So when we're in the clinic seeing patients on our own time, we often will work with medical students. So technically my uh, percentage is 30% clinical in when I'm seeing my own patients, although there's a rare day when I'm seeing patients by myself because there's usually some kind of learner who is, um, who is with me. And then the other half days of the week are either precepting or the administrative time to do the things I was talking about earlier. Um, I guess I will add, uh, it kind of depends on your program. So community-based residency programs will have different needs for participation in inpatient care. So in my former position, we actually did quite a bit of inpatient work, which I loved. So we would take two or four week rotations where we would um, be the attending for our inpatient service, be the attending for our OB service or 
um, for the nursing home. So there was a way to get even more variety within within our week, as if my my schedule wasn't uh, varied enough. So that's really going to vary based on the different program. But in most programs, they will have at least some needs where faculty will have inpatient roles as well. So I think that's kind of um, as diverse as it sounds. Uh, pretty much my typical week is that it's very atypical and that I get to do kind of a different thing every every half day which um, which keeps me on my toes as well. Wonderful, thank you Lindsay. Um, Lindsay's more in a community-based program, Mark is more in a, a university-based program where he's mostly working with medical students. Mark, if you could kind of uh, share your experiences in that setting. Sure, so um, unlike Lindsay who um, sort of came to residency with the intent or the, the early on decision to look for an academic program or an academic position, I kind of backed my way into a lot of this. When I came back to Richmond to work at VCU, it was for a clinical posting, and when I came back, I volunteered to work with medical students, and as I taught the clerkship students, I reconnected with this international inner city rural preceptorship program that I mentioned, but had a peripheral contact with them and then became more interested in doing some service learning and working with medical students that way, which led to a, a bit of a, a shift in my position from being strictly clinical to having a little bit of protected time for teaching. And I feel like I've sort of continued to wedge my way into other things. That's part of what I think is so great about being in the university in a department that's as, as active in so many ways as ours is there's always other things going on in other places that you can play a role. So when I started working with medical students and I started working with the International Inner City Rural Preceptorship, ICCRP, we also started a teaching clinic at one of our local free clinics and I became one of the primary preceptors for that. And from working with that program, as it expanded, it took a bit more of my time. And then I started doing some guest lectures and occasional uh, presentations for that program. And all of that just sort of grew into a larger role. Being on the university also, um, our Dean of, of Admissions is a, one of our family medicine faculty and the department was very supportive of having us, family, some of the family medicine faculty join the admissions committee so we could be a voice in that process and bringing in medical students that were particularly inclined towards primary care hopefully and especially family medicine. Um, a couple of years ago we started a new family medicine uh, admissions track, we call it FM STAT, and I'm up embarrassingly forgetting what the abbreviation stands for. Family Medicine Scholarship Training Admissions Track, I believe. These are students that specifically apply with a family medicine interest. They are interviewed for the medical school and the FM STAT program, and if they're accepted, the anticipation is they'll be with us for four years and we can provide more direct mentorship and guidance and connection with the department. So. I interview students for that program, I interview students for the admissions committee overall, um, with the idea being that the more family docs are in that position, the, the better we are at finding incoming students who will fit the mold. Um, I mentor FM STAT students directly. I work with I2CRP, as I mentioned. I work teaching one of the longitudinal courses that our medical school launched with the new curriculum. Um, I do the doctor-patient relationship segment of the patient, physician, and society course. So. I actually get to go and present and lecture to the entire medical school class, which is a new role for family medicine in our school. Um, but also, our university, VCU, has a strong interest in international and global health. So I've been leading medical trips to the Dominican Republic um, since 2005, initially just once a year on my own time as part of vacation time over the holidays in the winter. But as I grew into the role in the department, part of being given protected time for academics and protected time for teaching meant that I can use some of that time over the summer and lead a longer trip to the Dominican Republic where we take a larger number of medical students and pharmacy students. We focus on the clinical teaching in that setting as well as talking about broader social determinants of health. Those are all things that would have been harder to do if I was still in the community setting. Not entirely impossible, perhaps for all of them, but much, much more difficult. And what I find is uh, when you're in the setting and you get involved in programs and you show an interest and a motivation to do it, 
you can find additional opportunities, uh, often to the point of distraction. My, my chairman keeps telling me that I need to remember to eventually say no to something so I have time for other things that might arise later. But there's so much energy in the department and there's so many good things happening that it's hard to, to step back from these things. Um, as it stands right now, I'm about 50-50 in clinic about half the time and doing academic and curriculum work and admissions committee the other half. Uh, my clinical time is through the university clinics, so I spend about a day and a half at one of our satellite offices where I do almost entirely pediatrics. Um, a couple half days at our faculty practice where I work mostly with uninsured patients who are part of our hospital's patient assistance program. And then the half a day when I'm in the teaching clinic at the local free clinic counts as part of that time. And I'm just very fortunate to have a department chair that sees value in all of these activities and has specifically written into my, my job description and my contract and my payment and everything else the opportunity to do these things that are really important to me that bring value to the department, but more importantly, um, bring good medical education opportunities to our students at all levels of their education from M1 all the way to M4. Wonderful. John, you're also in a university-based setting. Is there anything that you would add here? Um, yeah, so I, I kind of work in this role of being the department chair and trying to give faculty advice about what a good way to de deploy their time. And I, I would emphasize that there's a, an astonishing amount of freedom to how the faculty role actually can evolve for people. Um, it, freedom in the sense that um, once you develop the skills of being able to get resources to support what you're doing, you're you're pretty wide open. Uh, we've had faculty in our department that have that have done things that I never would have particularly imagined that have turned out to be very important activities for our students and and very important for what they've been able to contribute as scholars in the field. Um, I, I would really underscore uh, what both Mark and Lindsay have said about the precepting role, and I guess I'd emphasize a couple of things there. We're really, really careful in our department about how we develop and identify preceptors. Um, Mark is correct that we always need more than we have. But by far the most important thing is that our preceptors are really superb clinicians that are the kind of doctors that our students want to grow up to be like. So f the first, I think, really important prerequisite is, is, is being an exceptionally good family doctor. And I think the second thing is that we want to have the students interacting with preceptors that love what they do and are passionate about what they do and believe in what they do. Um, when you have a student with you for four weeks, that's four weeks out of your year. But it's, for many of the third year students, the only experience they're going to have in family medicine. They're going to form their opinion of our field in large measure by what you do as the preceptor. So if, if you want to know one of the secrets to get a lot of students interested in family medicine, you put them in places to see really passionate family doctors doing a great job of being a family physician, and then really good things happen from that. And I think the other thing I would say, um, Mark was talking about some of the differences between the, the residency setting and the department setting or the, the, the community versus university-based program, our, our university-based departments are very different one to the next. The smallest of them have a lot of similar characteristics to a community residency program. They may do some more student teaching, but our larger departments um, have entire research divisions. So now you have people that you can learn research skills from as opposed to uh, and, and that can really mentor you in the, the process of learning how to get grants to support your work, learning how to design valid studies, kind of help you um, to get your, your work up and running. And that mentoring process is very important. It doesn't have to be on site. You can have mentors that are at a different location than you. Um, but just looking over where many of the attendees at our webinar are from, just looking at your your email addresses on the list of uh, attendees that we have. A lot of you are from university departments um, and you shouldn't assume that if you've seen one university department you've seen all of them because they're very different from one another and the same is true about community programs. So there's a great deal of overlap between these two um, and 
I think that you can you can have very academic careers in a community setting, and you can have a very clinical career in a university setting too. Wonderful, thank you, John. So in the process of this uh, discussion, all of our presenters have discussed uh, their particular breakdown of time between clinical work, between leadership, between other obligations. John, as a, a chair of a department, I was hoping that you could specifically sort of talk about how the FTEs are distributed and maybe even negotiated and um, what sort of roles are available in terms of breakdown of FTEs. Sure. So. Um... A lot of times the faculty role um, breaks out into this notion of full-time equivalent. So if 100% if of your time is one full-time equivalent, then all of us have jobs that, that, that break out in different ways and they change over the course even of a year um, uh, as a research grant starts and then ends uh, as we become a course director. For most of the faculty in our department, people start off with a lot of clinical time and then when they become a course director, that may have, you know, 20% time protected to be the director of that course, at which point you become 80% clinical and 20% running that course. Um, or you get a research grant that covers 20% of your time, and maybe you're a, a co-investigator on a grant that one of the senior faculty have, and that protects 10% of your time. So over the course of, of your career, your, your actual time and effort changes in part depending on what you're working on and in part depending on what the money is coming in to support. MD faculty, physician faculty, can always go to the clinic and earn their salaries. Um, for for um, PhD faculty members, their salaries are supported by endowments or by uh, philanthropy and mostly by grants that they get um, or by courses that they lead. And so um, across my department is just an enormous diversity. I think there's 93 faculty in my department, and there's probably 93 different job descriptions if you really look at it. Um, at its best, people are able to pursue what they're passionate about, and our job as a senior faculty is to help them to be successful in those things that are contributing uniquely to our department. Um, and, and that's part of what we're looking for when we recruit faculty, people who have innovative and interesting ideas. Um, we, you know, we're fortunate that most of our physician faculty really like seeing patients. They don't find going to the clinic to be a bad thing to do, and in fact, many of them would sort of like to do more of that. Um, and so it, it's generally a, a balancing act about how um, you negotiate out what these various roles are. Over the course of time, as your job changes, if you're starting off precepting, there's a lot of skills. You know, I think Mark talked a little bit about evaluating learners. That's a really complex thing because obviously you expect really different things if you have a first year student on an introduction to clinical medicine course working with you versus a fourth year student on a sub internship. Since almost all of you uh, who are attending the webinar are residents, that kind of means you've been medical students and you, you very much know. Um, that your expectations of a first-year student are really different than the expectations of a fourth year. So you develop um, the, the ability to have perspective about that over time. And then as you, if you're employed by a residency or by a department, you also start to get into classroom teaching skills, which is, um, Mark was talking about lecturing to an entire medical school class. Here in Oregon, we have 140 students per class, so if I'm lecturing to the second year class, I'm in a big lecture hall talking for 45 minutes to them, which is a completely different skill than precepting one-on-one -on -one in the clinic. Um, all of these represent faculty development. You have to learn these skills. You're, they're not necessarily all that, uh, they're not necessarily included in your residency. So when you're starting off in your faculty career, you're a learner in these various capacities, whether it's doing research or, or, um, or, or classroom teaching or designing a curriculum or designing an evaluation uh, uh, program for a course that you are in charge of. And all of those are skills you just have to learn over time and have to have mentors to help you learn. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Mark or Lindsay, is there anything else that you would add to this? 
All right. So I, I think actually both Mark and Lindsay mentioned in the course of the discussion so far um, what kind of their breakdown looks like. And if there are more specific questions about that, maybe we can answer that later on in the talk. I do want to move on uh, to the discussion of the surge, since I know for many of the residents on the call this evening, this is something that they're um, in particular uh, very interested about. So I, I did want to start by mentioning two websites that I think are, are wonderful sites for um, being able to find information about careers in family medicine. Um, the first one is uh, familymedicinecareers.com, um, which is partially run by STFM, and the next one is AFP Career Link. Um, both are great resources for finding departments that have positions open. Um, but the other thing I would mention is that uh, cold calls definitely have a role as well. Um, and uh, hopefully Mark, Lindsay, and John will be able to uh, just elaborate a little bit more about this and what role these play. Let's go ahead and start off uh, with Lindsay on um, how, how specifically, Lindsay, you found your position and any suggestions that you would have about uh, searching for a position. Yeah, sure, I'll start. So uh, I think I kind of alluded to it earlier, but um, I, I heard about the, my first position out of, um, I guess when I was transitioning out of private practice from basically going to TAFP meetings and networking and being active in my state academy. So I've participated in various committees through the TAFP for years now. And as part of that, you get to meet people who are involved in academic family medicine as well as other interesting careers. So as part of that, I had met my, my future boss and um, knew that he worked at a residency program. And he happened to be pretty open about talking about how he was looking for faculty. And I said, well, I didn't know what I was doing. And so uh, that's kind of how it all started. Um, I will say when I went around to kind of transition and look for a different position, uh, kind of the same thing happened. So um, through networking and being involved in both my county academy uh, family medicine and state academy, uh, as well as networking at AAFP and SCFM, um, kind of heard about what was out there and went from there. Uh, so for me, it kind of everything just fell into place. Uh, I, I guess the take-home points I would give would be to not just rely on job postings that are out there, but to start to build a network of people who you know are in academic family medicine. And if you happen to know a city or state you know you want to be in, you know, being able to email uh, people who are at that program and say, hey, do you know if uh, you're hiring? Uh, even when things aren't posted, a lot of times people who are working in whether it be a residency or medical school, kind of know what the forecast is for are they going to be looking for people. And as I found, especially in university settings, sometimes, you know, while they may not be actively looking um, for the right candidate who's really interested, there may be something that can be created or be opened up. So I guess don't be afraid to email your contacts and build a network so that when it comes time around to look, you can put feelers out and, and look for jobs. And then I guess finally I would say don't discount the value of going to STFM and AFP meetings and this isn't, I'm not getting paid to say this, but <laughs> you do meet people who are passionate, who are curious, and who probably share similar goals. And, you know, you may meet someone, get their card, and hang on to it because um, you never know a year or two down the road when it might come in handy. That's a wonderful point, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, Mark, once you've actually gotten to the stage where you are, you've set up an interview and you're getting ready to go to the interview, um, maybe you could discuss for the, for the uh, people who are present this evening kind of what that interview consists of uh, from the applicant perspective. No, um, I can do that. I'll qualify it by saying that I was already working within the department when I interviewed. So it would have been a very different experience had I come entirely from outside. The, uh, the way the interview process went for, for me is the job, even though I was being hired internally, there was a national job search, a posting, et cetera. So I applied, as anyone else would, I sent in my letter of interest and my CV and set a date for the interview. On the day of the interview itself, I went in and I, I met with um, folks in the department who were, were colleagues who I'd worked with, but also wanted to make sure that I was the fit that they needed for that space. 
And in my case, because I was interviewing specifically for the role of the medical director for the I2CRP program, um, the discussion focused a lot on my previous experiences working in medically underserved communities in urban and rural settings in Virginia and then um, overseas with my work in the Dominican Republic. Um, my sense of from the questions was to ensure that the skill set that I brought with me, the, exper the experiences I brought with me, and the uh, teaching experiences I had up until that point fit within the department's need and vision of what this program would, would, would develop into. Um, some of that is vetted by your CV. Some of that is vetted by references. I submitted my, my references as anyone else would need to do for that position and they were able to, to follow up with that and provide um, some context for where I was coming from. I think if you're coming from outside, the process is obviously different. You, don't, you may not know folks as well. You may not know exactly the, uh, the process for that day. But I think that a couple of things can help with that. One of them would be, as Lindsay was discussing career choices and how to find positions, the thing that struck me in my case was the value of mentorship and talking to people that knew me as I was even just thinking about these ideas. Um, even before I knew I was interested in coming back to VCU, I had stayed in touch with the department and as my interest grew, I had links I could come back and talk with. When I got to the point where I actually was going to talk to our chairman, even before, this is before the interview, this is um, a few years ago when I first moved into a more clinical role, I could talk to mentors of mine who had been through these sorts of things before and get some advice on exactly how to go through this, this process. Um, and I think that those are really important. For me, the the one-on-one -on -one mental relationship that I had with individuals, even if I had not been applying to my own department um, or department that, I, that I'd worked with in the past, I would have been able to ask them, what are the things that you think they're going to look for? What do you expect? What should I expect? Do you know the folks there better than I do? Um, in some cases, the mentor or the connection that you made, maybe the person who clued you into the position, and the opportunity and getting a sense from them as to what the the process has been for other applicants and what sort of information you might want to have available or bring with you or just be able to speak on if need be can make that process go more smoothly. Thanks, Mark. Lindsay, do you have anything that you would add to that in terms of your own experiences as an applicant going through the interview process? And is there any advice that you might have for uh, residents who are applying now about good questions that they should maybe be asking during your interview day? Well, I mean, certainly you want to um, figure out what your daily and weekly tasks are going to look like, what your expectations are for clinical productivity. But those are questions that, you know, you probably can hear from anyone. I think specific to academics, the things that you would want to think about, especially as early career faculty, is what's the job going to do for you in return? So that sounds a, a little funny, but I, I guess the point is, so there's lots of things you can bring as a junior faculty. You bring energy. Uh, and, um, you know, can relate to uh, the students and residents you work with. But you also have growing that you're going to need to do over the course of your first couple years in your position. So I think things to ask are things like what kind of mentoring will I have? You know, whether they have a formal mentoring uh, program with in the residency or the medical school. Um, what opportunities they would have for personal development. So would they support things like doing a faculty development fellowship? Um, many medical schools will offer mini programs within, within their own departments. Um, or if you're thinking about other more substantial things, you know, would they support time away at all to, to help you build your skill set as you kind of develop into a faculty role? And Certainly starting out, making sure you have time also for CME and education. Again, you want to make sure that in addition to giving to your program or your university, that it's also helping you to become a better teacher along the way. And I guess finally, if you're looking more at a community-based program, but you know don't want to rule out a university setting in the future, you want to make sure that you're going to have time for your own scholarly activity and keeping up your CV. So 
Um, I think most um, residency programs are ramping up their scholarly activity, so it shouldn't be an issue, but you want to make sure that you'll have resources to help you should you want to publish, present, work on textbooks and chapters in books, things like that. So if they don't have people on the faculty who are doing it, if they're willing to put you in touch with people or help you out with that. Um, I think those are the things that are worth asking to make sure that that not only are you going to be able to give to the program, but they're going to be able to help you continue to get stronger. Thank you. John, you have kind of a unique perspective as the chair of a department. What I was hoping that you could comment on what you feel that as a department, um, the, the department and really the whole you know residency or medical school community that's interviewing the applicant is looking for in an applicant on the interview day or during the interview process. Well, thanks, Esther. This is a very important question. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm just sitting here listening and reflecting back. I've probably interviewed 300 faculty members over the course of my tenure as chair for 15 years and trying to sort out, you know, what really stands out to me. Um, so first of all, I would say that, you know, at least speaking for myself now, I think you're better off not to think that you're interviewing for a position or interviewing for a job. It's better to think, is this a group that I want to join and be part of? Do I want to be a partner in this, in this, in this effort? Do I want to be a part of the faculty of this residency or a part of the faculty of this department? What are they doing that would, that would make this a place where I could contribute meaningfully to their mission? Uh, how good of a fit is it? When you're looking at residencies, it's, it's impossible to not say, well, try to pick a really strong residency that has a great reputation and go there. But when you're a faculty member, I know when I came to Oregon, there were only six of us on the faculty here, and all of us were assistant professors except for the chair. There was nothing that made the department stand out as being some place that I would go across the country for, and yet it was the only program west of the Mississippi River that I even sent a CV to because I had met the department chairman when I was a fellow at North Carolina, and I thought that he was a man I could learn how to write from. I felt like I was a pretty good teacher and a pretty good clinician, but I was insecure about some of the scholarly things. So I was looking for a place that was going to be a great department that could, I could be part of helping to build, as opposed to a place that had already solved a lot of problems. Um, and because I think that for me, what jazzes me up the most about my job is being part of, of something that, that can be great. And so I'm looking for folks that, that want to be part of our faculty as opposed to want to work for the department. I certainly don't think of the faculty as working for me or for the residency director. I think we work with each other. And so it's more like joining a group or being a partner in a group in, in how I'm, I'm trying to decide which people rise to the top for me. Um, I think um, I agree with what Lindsay had to say about whether there's resources available to support your growth as a faculty member, but I would also add that you want to get some idea about the department's track record of success. You can talk all about all you want about how many half days of protected time you have, but a real good question is, well, for the faculty who decided it, to try and be promoted to associate professor here, how successful are they? What's your success rate like? How many of your faculty have been promoted within the first six years that they're there, um, and uh, how many have not? What you, what, you know, what are the, the you know when you failed um, to get somebody promoted to associate professor? What has been the reason why you failed? Um, how many of your faculty care about uh, promotion in the academic world? Um, in a medical school, if you want to have um, positions of influence in the dean's office or as a course director. You really need to be a senior faculty member, and that means an associate or full professor. So are you going to be able to get to where you want to be with regards to the, the skills you need to learn? And is this the right group uh, uh, to, to pursue that goal with? Um, I also would tell you that it is all about relationships, and relationships may matter more than positions. Some of the most important interviews I've ever had were with people who didn't come here, but ended up being very important scholars, and maybe they came to came to Oregon five or ten years after the initial time I met them, because we developed a relationship. 
I see them at STFM meetings, I follow their careers, they call me when they have questions, and then some day later they're working on a paper with me or they're working on a research project with me. So it, you're not just interviewing to pick which place to be, you're also establishing relationships with people that for me have transcended the entire 30 years I've been in family medicine. Um, some of the, the people I met early on who I never worked in the same department with became really important career relationships for me. So the interview process is pretty multidimensional. It's not as linear as when you apply to medical school or apply to a residency program. Here you're not applying to something that's time limited to four years or three years. It's more of a relationship that you're building with the people who are there and those relationships can bear fruit whether you end up working in that place or not. Um, I, I would very much agree with my, what Mark said. Um, don't worry about whether there's a posted position or not. If you're interested in a particular program, call um, the program director or the department chairman or send an email or write a letter and, and attach your CV because we keep those. Uh, if we don't have a position right now, then we keep those until we have a position and then we contact people. And in a department the size of ours, we literally have a faculty opening all the time. I don't think there's been a single day in 15 years where we weren't in the process of trying to fill some position because when our faculty, our faculty has grown greatly, um, but we also have faculty who become residency directors or department chairs or research directors in other places after they've spent a few years with us and that's a gigantic victory for our department when we're successful at producing somebody who becomes an important leader in our field. Um, it isn't like I'm looking for people who are going to stay here their whole career necessarily, although many of them do. Um, I, we're really looking at um, their, the opportunity here as a launching pad to a career that, that we hope will make an impact on our discipline and, um, and or on our state. And so um, I would think about it less like interviewing for a job and more like deciding which group to join, um, who share which which place most closely shares your values, who are the kind of people you'd really want to have as your own physician or as your own teacher, because I think that becomes where you can really learn the skills that you that you're most um, seeking. And finally, I think it's incredibly important that to the greatest extent possible you have some idea of, of what it is you want to do with your career. Now that's not the same thing as having a five-year plan. I don't think you need to, to come into an entry-level faculty interview knowing that you want to be a residency director or a department chairman. In fact, I worry a little bit when people have, think that they have everything sorted out quite that well, but I do like it when people say, well, I think that I love teaching and I think I'm pretty good at that. I really want to know whether I can be successful enough academically to actually be in a tenure track at a university and I think I want to come there and find out whether I can, can, can get papers published or do classroom teaching and not freak out about it uh, where people can help me to develop those skills. In fact, it's probably more important to know what your questions are. Um, than, to, than, than to have career goals in the sense of positions you want to be in. So again, I would focus on relationship building, whether you end up going to that place or not. The relationships are very important. And I would focus on finding a group that is the sort of group you want to be a member of, if that makes any sense. Um, this is Mark. I wanted to add just to that that I... So Definitely. That, John's last points about the relationship. That was part of what led me to feel so comfortable when I decided to move into a more academic place, um, working and looking at VCU as making VCU my priority. The idea that I had spent time with these folks, that I had had a chance to talk to them, that I didn't know the level of detail that John suggested in terms of um, promotion success and rates of, of, you know, published articles and things of that nature, but. I knew that I had folks that were very committed to this mission. Whichever mission it might be, the research folks were very good and committed to that. The pre-doc folks were very good. There's a lot of crosstalk, but I knew that everyone was there um, because from what I can judge, they want to be there. They like what they're doing and the department has um, an openness to helping you define that role in a way that's really important. So in my case, 
I guess having been a community preceptor and interfacing with the department in a way that might not have been as formal perhaps or and certainly not as consistent as it is now allowed me to start to get a feel for what the department was like, what the culture was like, who the people were. And it allowed me then when I looked to do something more academic to make a commitment to this opportunity compared to some other ones that were available at the time because I knew these folks and I knew the way that they did things. And I didn't know all the details that I would be doing, but I knew that they were coming from a place that I would feel comfortable. Thank you. So all of our presenters have discussed uh, about have discussed uh, interviewing with uh, an eye towards the future in mind, and so I wanted to move us along to a discussion of what uh, career paths are available within family medicine. And John, I'm going to come back to you again if you could uh, maybe talk just a little bit about this progression and also really what what determines advancement. Well, I noticed that one of our participants has asked a question here. What are some of the differences between the responsibilities of assistant associate and full professors? Um, and that kind of segues pretty nice into, nicely into this slide and, and what we're talking about here. So we have a, a fair number of people in academic family medicine who don't care very much about this advancement through faculty rank kind of thing. Um, lots of times people don't understand it. And so they say, well, it sounds to me like really this is a little bit like I have to fill out a bunch of forms and write a bunch of papers and then some committee over at the dean's office is going to decide whether I can be an associate professor or not. But in the academic world, um, associate and full professors are senior faculty members. In some places, you have to be promoted or you have to leave if you're in the tenure track. Um, but in a lot of places, um, you can be in a clinical track and this really has to do with you know, how well you're doing your job. Um, in, in, in our school, um, if you want to be the chair of the admissions committee, if you want to be on the curriculum committee, if you want to be on the student progress board, if you want to be a director of a major course, that really, they really want somebody who has senior faculty rank to do those things. Um, a good way of thinking about this, um, and I think the person who asked the question is Tanya, a good way to think about it, Tanya, is people go to college because they want to learn from professors. And why did you choose to go to a four-year university as opposed to a community college? Well, you wanted to go to learn from somebody who didn't just teach from a book, but is actually the person who wrote the book. And so the creation of new knowledge is a really big part of what um, the medical school based, you know, tenure line um, associate and full professors need to do. They need to be people who are writing papers and books and creating new knowledge that they then are using as the foundation of their teaching. And while that doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, it certainly is going to need, it's going to apply to people who want to be in leadership positions in university settings more than anything else, I think. Um, and so um, that's the way I would, would think about that. Most medical schools determine this advancement based on this, the, the traditional so-called three-legged academic stool, uh, 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 three-legged stool of teaching and community or university service and scholarship. Um, scholarship takes the form of presenting at meetings and sharing ideas with your peers. Um, if, if you think about it, um, the, the scholarship is valuable when the people who read your work and listen to your presentations decide that it's valuable. Um, and that is a peer review process, whether you're submitting a paper to a journal or whether you're writing a grant that's reviewed by a review panel or whether you're um, giving, being invited to present at a national meeting or selected to present at a regional meeting. Your teaching reviews kind of are, are you a really good teacher? Do you have, are your students successful? Are you getting awards from your students for your teaching skills? And community service has to do with serving on committees. Um, it has to do with your clinical work and the degree to which you're recognized for clinical excellence. Um, and sometimes it has to do with service, like being the president. Of
John, are you there? If they don't have some protection for their position, then they tend to be vulnerable to any budget cut that goes on at the university. And so once you've gotten to a senior faculty rank, you're often assigned tenure, which allows you to know that your position is protected from budget cuts like that. So I would say tenure is clearly more important to PhD faculty than to MD faculty. Some medical schools don't even have it. Um, I de declined the opportunity to have tenure until I became a department chairman and then I was tenured here mostly because I like disagreeing publicly with the dean a lot and when I do that I like to know that, that he can't get rid of me. All right. Uh, Lindsay or Mark, do you have any uh, points or pieces of advice that you'd like to add in here, um, particularly for other uh, junior faculty members who may be starting out on this journey? Anything that uh, you would advise them in terms of starting out this career? Um, I can start off, I guess. Um, when you do start out in more of a junior faculty role, I would recommend to take advantage of all those great senior faculty who are around you. So you're not a resident anymore, but you do have people who are willing to teach who are great teachers. So if you feel like your skill set isn't as strong, don't be afraid to be a learner as well as a teacher um, because that's just going to make you stronger as you grow in your career. And then I guess I would be a second in terms of academics would be to stay curious and try to find collaborations that make sense. It's a lot easier to publish, present, get excited about doing things when you have someone else to do it with. So the STFM groups have, can be a good way to find people who are interested in you know, similar research topics. So especially if you're in a community-based program where you may or may not have people who are interested in the same thing that you are, um, it's a good way to work with people from, you know, from across the country. Um, and then I guess going back to, you know, looking at your search, especially if you are thinking about being in a community-based program, uh, it's helpful to ask what the faculty there are interested in, um, because if you have overlapping research interests, it's going to be a lot easier to get stuff done, to present, to publish in that setting than if you're kind of out there trying to do it on your own. Um, so from my perspective, I would just come at it from a little bit of a different angle in the sense that until uh, just about two months ago, I have been an assistant clinical professor at VCU since 2004, more or less, because my role was clinical teaching and it was defined that way. I did not have um, a university-defined job. Essentially, my chairman and I as I became more interested in doing more teaching um, and there was space in which I could do it and he was supportive of my, my making these adjustments, uh, found the salary, found the money to cover my salary without making it a formal university position, which actually gave us a fair amount of flexibility on how we defined my job. As long as we could cover the salary, as long as that balanced out, if my chair decided that it was valuable to have me go to the Dominican Republic for two months or for two weeks with medical students, they could make that happen. Um, it meant that I haven't really registered on the university's promotion and tenure listings for a while because I haven't been in that particular track. Um, only once I went into VCU's, so in, in two, months ago, two months ago when I became the ICCRV medical director, I moved from being an assistant clinical professor to being an actual assistant professor within the department. Um, which means that now my my supervisor and friend and I sit down and we're starting to think about in the next year or two we need to get my my ducks in a row to go up to talk about promotion to the next level. It's something that I think I had good guidance in my career and positioned myself for, even though I was only in the clinical designation. I did a lot of the things that I that John mentioned count towards your eventual prom promotion. Um, but I'm only just now reaching that place, and frankly, I'm, I'm fine with that. Some people might have been a little worried that they weren't in the formal track earlier, but at the end of the day, I was doing something I enjoyed, and I was given the freedom and flexibility to explore this, and I felt fine with that, and I think that now that I'm in this position, the department will 
work with me and support me through the next step of the actual promotion tenure process to, to move along this, 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 in this direction. I would actually just put in one Thanks, more Mark. plug. Um, I would put in one more plug um, for if you're looking for guidance as to kind of what counts, so to speak. Um, while the AAFP degree of fellow is not an exact blueprint for, um, you know, for promotion in the academic sense, a lot of the things that are on that list are kind of good guide points in terms of thinking of the things that are valued within the family of family medicine. So. Um, would put a plug in for checking out the AAFP's website for the degree of fellow and it has kind of the application that walks you through all the different things that can count and every medical school department is going to have a different you know different things that count for promotion but those are certainly things that are valued in the profession and can be a good place to start. Thank you Lindsay that's a that's a great point. I do want to move us along now to uh, just some additional resources that STFM can offer to you in your path uh, into academic family medicine um, in order to leave us just a few uh, minutes for questions. So the first thing I wanted to mention is that, um, as me Tom mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I am the resident representative to the STFM board, which means that I, I can serve as a relay for you if there is additional programming that you'd like to see STFM provide, whether it be on pursuing a career in academic family medicine or something else um, in the realm of academic medicine or teaching. Um, I mentioned before that familymedicinecareers.com is a great resource uh, for searching for a possible position, um, but I also wanted to mention that STFM does offer uh, several fellowships as well as additional uh, faculty resources including online curriculum um, that are all available to you as you seek to develop uh, your own skills as a teacher and as a faculty member. Um, and also, as many of you know, the STFM offers a resource library, which does include a lot of wonderful resources, including PowerPoint presentations and curriculum uh, for faculty members uh, looking to develop courses or uh, just looking for um, some blueprints as they begin to develop their own programs. And as Lindsay and uh, Mark and John have all mentioned, conferences are a fantastic way um, both to network with other um, family medicine uh, academicians and form relationships, but also share research and educational tools. Uh, John, do you have anything that you would add to that as the president of STFM before we continue on to our question period? I just think that um, STFM is not only a valuable way to connect up with people who can mentor you when you're young, but you'll develop peer relationships with people who are at the same stage of training as you are. Um, I think I've gone to all of the STFM meetings but one or two in the last 30 years and the thing that has me going back there is not that I just learn things that when I when I go but I have um, friends that I've met many of whom I've never worked in the same department with but who are constant sources. I mean, I write papers with these people. I um, email back and forth with them. And when I see them at meetings, I compare notes with things that are happening in my department and in my state with the things that are happening in theirs. I get good ideas there about how to be better at my work. So um, I have found that throughout the course of my career, um, going to meetings like STFM and NAPCRAG have been really important um, parts of what's contributed uh, to my, the quality of the ideas I'm able to generate. It's a, it, it gives me a context because sometimes we work in our own departments, we work in our own settings, and we forget the fact that every place isn't the same. Um, so the only way to have perspective about that, I think, is to, is to have peers that are um, more diversely spread across the country in different kinds of places. And I think um, one of the, the really um, valuable things for me, and it has not gotten less valuable as I've gotten more expertise, more experience. It, it's actually gotten more valuable the more the better I've gotten at this. Okay, so we are at the So I'm going to move us along into our question time. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, yeah, Esther. So this, we are now at the end of our uh, presentation, and and we're at the point where we can take the panel can take questions from 
our participants. Um, while uh, you are thinking of or, or entering your questions, um, I'm just going to turn the page here, turn the, the table a little bit on Esther. She's done a great job as the kind of the moderator and pitching questions, getting good discussion going. But, um, but Esther, you didn't talk about your own journey, your own path, um, you know, as a, as a resident, obviously you, you must be interested in a career in academic medicine as the resident representative on the board of SDFM. Um, I mean, do you want to talk about kind of your interests or what got you interested or, or where you're headed from here? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the reminder, Tom, <laughs> while people are entering in their questions. Um, I'll just add that, you know, I, in addition to being passionate about medicine from the time that I was very young, I um, was also very passionate about teaching. I actually started teaching when I was in high school and started teaching science courses throughout college. And um, even as a, as a medical student, was very drawn to development of curriculum and development of education at the medical school level and served in our medical school government as a curriculum representative. Um, and then coming to residency, um, this has been a continued passion of mine, which is what drew me to SDFM. Um, I think Tom mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I'm actually in Kenya right now um, doing some global health work, and the school that I'm working with, I've been partnered with for several years now, and part of the reason that I approach global health through the context of the school is that I actually feel that one of the strongest impacts we can have on, on the health of our communities is through education. Um, and I believe that key to that is developing good educators, and um, particularly in areas of the world where um, family medicine is so desperately needed. Um, I think it's it's important to continue developing our skills as teachers so that we can teach other family medicine doctors to become teachers and hopefully better provide for the community that way. Great. Well, thanks for um, providing some of how uh, some of where you're at. Um, we have had a couple of questions roll in here. Um, so I'll pitch the, the first one. Um, really, I'll just to kind of summarize the question, I think it really, the, the core of the question is um, really around average salary of family um, physician um, faculty um, and how do you find those average salaries? I mean, you know, just what, you know, how do you know when you're um, getting an offer, whether something's fair or not fair? Can anybody comment on that? Yeah, this is John. Um, I can comment about that. Um, so there are some national standards that get published about salaries for physicians. The, 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 the usual standard that people use is the Medical Group Management Association, or MGMA salaries, which are broken out by region of the country, and they're broken out by whether family doctors are doing a full scope of practice or outpatient-only practice, et, et cetera. MGMA has both a clinical practice mean and 25th and 75th percentile uh, salaries, and it also has an academic practice mean mm -hmm. and 25th and 75th percentile. And if you look at those, you'll see that the academic salary tends to be about 10 percent less or so in general. This obviously varies some based on how productive people are um, in terms of their clinical work and, and, and whatnot. There is also um, a salary standard from the AAMC, the uh, Association of American Medi Medical Colleges, that really look at clinical and basic science departments in medical school and what you know, professors and associate professors and assistant professors and instructors in those settings are paid. I mean, again, there's regional means. It's different in the western region than the eastern region, and you can look at the uh, variability from one region to the next. Um, about where that stands. One of the challenges if you're interviewing for a position and you're trying to sort out the salary is that there's an awful lot of apples and oranges here. Um, some departments have very, very rich benefit structures. Um, so for example, in our department, we pay for all of our faculty, you know, the malpractice is covered, uh, their membership in professional societies, including STFM, is paid for everybody on the faculty. Um, they have um, uh, th they have journal subscriptions that are paid for by the department, um, and in other places there's there's a, a different structure to how the benefits are designed. So whether you're looking at a private practice or at an academic position, you really need to be looking broadly at the whole compensation package because salary alone doesn't tell you the whole story. 
um, and, and getting an idea not just what the average salary is, but what the spread of the salary is across various people in the department uh, can sort of help you see whether they're keeping up or not. Um, but I, th I think that you know, we're not going to be able to retain people in academic medicine if this difference widens substantially. So most academic departments are paying higher salaries to faculty now, just as most private practices are paying higher salaries for physicians who are starting. Um, you know, incomes of family doctors are going up pretty significantly right now. Um, and, and how significantly depends a little bit on the area of the country you're in and on the kind of practice you have. Thanks, John. That was a great, great answer. Very, uh, a lot of good information there. We do have, we're just about out of time, but we do have a couple of more, I think, really good questions that, um, if it's okay with the panel, I'll go ahead and throw them out there. Um, the next one is, um, how well do you think um, academic medicine blends with being a parent, which I think really touches on a work-life balance issue in terms of uh, the number of roles you play as an academic family physician. Uh, how does that blend with, um, you know, your personal life, uh, whether it's as a parent or a spouse or other interests? This is Mark. I can speak to that a little bit directly, which is that um, I think there's flexibility to to work around that to the need that you that you choose. I my wife and I don't have kids, so I probably get more involved in this than maybe other folks might. I have more of my own time I can put to it, but I'm comfortable with that. This is something I enjoy doing. Speaking from watching the my coworkers who have families, uh, children ranging from you know an infant a couple years ago who's now five all the way up to teenagers, I, I do get the sense that there's a lot of flexibility in this. There may be some days where you're not in clinic and your academic responsibilities are a little more flexible so you can be part of a carpool. You can come in a little bit early, go a little bit late. There may be some days when you're working on things that can be worked at from home. I, I suspect that those all get negotiated out very individually within the departments themselves. Um, residency faculty, I certainly can't speak to that. That may not be quite as adaptable. But when you're working on the medical education side or the research side of the medical student portion, you'll probably have days that are more, more manageable and more adaptable to your needs at that given moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a few more questions. I'll just take one more because um, we're already over time. Um, there's one more that I think might be worth, uh, worth getting a response on. Um, to the whole group. Um, how important is pra practicing OB as an academic family physician? So this is John. I can, I can take this one on. Um, because the residency review committee requires that there be, a, there be faculty members in every residency that include maternity care in their practice, that every residency needs some faculty who do OB. Now, that being said, there's amazing variability from program to program about how, how big or small of a commitment they have to that. In some cases, it's a small number of faculty who do um, the deliveries and do the teaching with residents about that. And in other cases, nearly everybody on the faculty might do that. It, so I, I would say there is demand. There is a need for faculty members who have a full scope of practice, including OB. Um, it, there's plenty of positions that wouldn't require that, um, but I think that it adds to your portfolio if you have that kind of clinical uh, skill set. Great. Thanks, John. Well, th I really want to thank um, Drs. Johnston, Botsford, Ryan, and Salt for the fantastic job they did with today's topics, the materials, discussion, and responses. Um, you know, this, this webinar took a lot of their time not only this evening, but in preparation and, and uh, a rehearsal that we did and just kind of discussing it online. So thank you so much for um, your, your commitment and your efforts this evening. Um, and I really also want to thank everybody who participated tonight in uh, the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine's Introduction to Careers in Academic Family Medicine webinar. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, within 24 hours of completing the webinar, you will receive a survey in your email inbox, and we hope you'll be able to rate the overall satisfaction uh, with the webinar. Uh, so we hope you'll take a few moments uh, to, co to complete the survey and, and electronically return it to us. And then finally, um, don't forget to check the STFM website for more information about other webinars. Uh, and you need to go to stfm.org backslash webinar. Again, this webinar was recorded, and if you wanted to go back and look at it or, pre or review a certain section, um, you certainly will be able to do 